I want to begin by thanking the Center for Philosophy of Religion for the invitation to participate in tonight's debate. The question of the correct foundation of morality is one that is not only of tremendous academic interest, but also one that has enormous practical application for our lives. Now to begin with an important point of agreement. Dr. Harris and I agree that there are objective moral values and duties. To say that moral values and duties are objective is to say that they are valid and binding independent of human opinion. For example, to say that the Holocaust was objectively evil is to say that it was evil even though the Nazis who carried it out thought that it was good and it would still have been evil even if the Nazis had won World War II and succeeded in brainwashing or exterminating everyone who disagreed with them so that everybody thought the Holocaust was good. One of the great merits of Dr. Harris's recent book, The Moral Landscape, is his bold affirmation of the objectivity of moral values and duties. He inveighs against what he calls the overeducated, atheistic, moral nihilists and relativists who refuse to condemn as objectively wrong terrible atrocities like the genital mutilation of little girls. He rightly declares, if only one person in the world held down a terrified, struggling, screaming little girl, cut off her genitals with a septic blade and sewed her back up, the only question would be how severely that person should be punished. What is not in question is that such a person has done something horribly, objectively wrong. The question before us this evening then is what is the best foundation for the existence of objective moral values and duties? What grounds them? What makes certain actions objectively good or evil, right or wrong? In tonight's debate, I'm going to defend two basic contentions. First, if God exists, then we have a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. And second, if God does not exist, then we do not have a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. Now notice that these are conditional claims. I shall not be arguing tonight that God exists. Maybe Dr. Harris is right that atheism is true. That wouldn't affect the truth of my two contentions. All that would follow is that objective moral values and duties would then, contrary to Dr. Harris, not exist. So let's look at that first contention together. If God exists, then we have a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. Here, I want to examine two subpoints with you. First, theism provides a sound foundation for objective moral values. Moral values have to do with what is good or evil. On the theistic view, objective moral values are grounded in God. As Saint Anselm saw, God is by definition the greatest conceivable being and therefore the highest good. Indeed, he is not merely perfectly good, he is the locus and paradigm of moral value. God's own holy and loving nature provides the absolute standard against which all actions are measured. He is, by nature, loving, generous, faithful, kind, and so forth. Thus, if God exists, objective moral values exist, wholly independent of human beings. Second, theism provides a sound foundation for objective moral duties. On a theistic view, objective moral duties are constituted by God's commands. God's moral nature is expressed in relation to us in the form of divine commandments, which constitute our moral duties or obligations. Far from being arbitrary, God's commandments must be consistent with his holy and loving nature. Our duties then are constituted by God's commandments and these in turn reflect 
his essential character. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the whole moral duty of man can be summed up in the two great commandments. First, you shall love the Lord your God with all your strength and with all your soul and with all your heart and with all your mind. And second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On this foundation, we can affirm the objective rightness of love, generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality, and condemn as objectively wrong selfishness, hatred, abuse, discrimination, and oppression. In summary then, theism has the resources for a sound foundation for morality. It grounds both objective moral values and objective moral duties. And hence, I think it's evident that if God exists, we have a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. Let's turn then to my second contention that if God does not exist, then we do not have a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. Consider first the question of objective moral values. If God does not exist, then what basis remains for the existence of objective moral values? In particular, why think that human beings would have objective moral worth? On the atheistic view, human beings are just accidental byproducts of nature, which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust called the planet Earth, and which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. On atheism, it's hard to see any reason to think that human well-being is objectively good, any more than insect well-being or rat well-being or hyena well-being. This is what Dr. Harris calls the value problem. The purpose of Dr. Harris's book, The Moral Landscape, is to explain the basis on atheism of the existence of objective moral values. He explicitly rejects the view that moral values are platonic objects existing independent of the world. So, his only recourse is to try to ground moral values in the natural world. But how can you do that, since nature in and of itself is just morally neutral? On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the behavioral byproducts of biological evolution and social conditioning. Just as a troop of baboons exhibit cooperative and even self-sacrificial behavior because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival, so their primate cousins, Homo sapiens, have evolved a sort of herd morality for precisely the same reasons. As a result of sociobiological pressures, there has evolved among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality which functions well in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything that makes this morality objectively binding and true. The philosopher of science, Michael Roos, reports, the position of the modern evolutionist is that humans have an awareness of morality because such an awareness is of biological worth. Morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. If we were to rewind the film of human evolution and start anew, people with a very different set of moral values might well have evolved. As Darwin himself wrote in The Descent of Man, if men were reared under precisely the same conditions as hive bees, there can hardly be a doubt that our unmarried females would, like the worker bees, think it a sacred duty to kill their brothers. And mothers 
would strive to kill their fertile daughters, and no one would think of interfering. For us to think that human beings are special and our morality is objectively true is to succumb to the temptation to speciesism, that is to say an unjustified bias in favor of one's own species. If there is no God, then any reason for regarding the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens on this planet as objectively true seems to have been removed. Take God out of the picture, and all you seem to be left with is an ape-like creature on a speck of dust beset with delusions of moral grandeur. Richard Dawkins' assessment of human worth may be depressing, but why, on atheism, is he mistaken when he says there is at bottom no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pointless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for being. So how does Sam Harris propose to solve the value problem? The trick he proposes is simply to redefine what he means by good and evil in non-moral terms. He says, we should define good as that which supports the well-being of conscious creatures. So, he says, questions about values are really questions about the well-being of conscious creatures. And therefore, he concludes, it makes no sense to ask whether maximizing well-being is good. Why not? Because he's redefined the word good to mean the well-being of conscious creatures. So, to ask, why is maximizing creatures' well-being good is on his definition the same as asking, why does maximizing creatures' well-being maximize creatures' well-being? It's just a tautology. It's just talking in circles. So Dr. Harris has quote unquote solved the value problem just by redefining his terms. It's nothing but wordplay. At the end of the day, Dr. Harris isn't really talking about moral values at all. He's just talking about what's conducive to the flourishing of sentient life on this planet. Seen in this light, his claim that science can tell us a great deal about what contributes to human flourishing is hardly controversially, uh, controversial. Of course it can, just as it can tell us what is conducive to the flourishing of corn or mosquitoes uh, or bacteria. His so-called moral landscape, which features the highs and lows of human flourishing, isn't really a moral landscape at all. Thus, Dr. Harris has failed to solve the value problem. He hasn't provided any justification or explanation for why, on atheism, moral values would objectively exist at all. His so-called solution is just a semantical trick of an arbitrary and idiosyncratic redefinition of the terms good and evil in non-moral vocabulary. Second question, does atheism provide a sound foundation for objective moral duties? Duty has to do with moral obligation or prohibition, what I ought or ought not to do. Here, the reviewers of the moral landscape have been merciless in pounding Dr. Harris's attempt to provide a naturalistic account of moral obligation. Two problems stand out. First, natural science tells us only what is, not what ought to be, the case. As philosopher Jerry Fodor has written, science is about facts, not norms. It might tell us how we are, but it wouldn't tell us what is wrong with how we are. In particular, it cannot tell us that we have a moral obligation to take actions which are conducive to human flourishing. So, if there is no God, what foundation remains for objective moral duties? On the naturalistic view, human beings are just animals 
and animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a lion kills a zebra, it kills the zebra, but it doesn't murder the zebra. When a great white shark forcibly copulates with a female, it forcibly copulates with her, but it doesn't rape her. For none of these actions is forbidden or obligatory. There is no moral dimension to these actions. So if God does not exist, why think we have any moral obligations to do anything? Who or what imposes these obligations upon us? Where do they come from? It's very hard to see why they would be anything more than a subjective impression ingrained into us by societal and parental conditioning. On the atheistic view, certain actions such as rape and incest may not be biologically and socially advantageous and so in the course of human development have become taboo, that is socially unacceptable behavior. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that such acts are really wrong. Such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. On the atheistic view, the rapist who chooses to flout the herd morality is doing nothing more serious than acting unfashionably, the moral equivalent, if you will, of Lady Gaga. If there is no moral law giver, then there is no objective moral law. And if there is no objective moral law, then we have no objective moral duties. Thus, Dr. Harris's view lacks any source for objective moral duty. Second problem, ought implies can. A person is not morally responsible for an action which he is unable to avoid. For example, if somebody shoves you into another person, you're not responsible for bumping into him. You had no choice. But Sam Harris believes that all of our actions are causally determined and that there is no free will. Dr. Harris rejects not only libertarian accounts of free will, but also compatibilistic accounts of freedom. But if there is no free will, then no one is morally responsible for anything. In the end, Dr. Harris admits this, though it's tucked away in the end notes of his volume. Moral responsibility, he says, and I quote, is a social construct, not an objective reality. I quote, in neuroscientific terms, no person is more or less responsible than any other for the actions they perform. His thoroughgoing determinism spells the end of any hope or possibility of objective moral duties because on his worldview, we have no control over what we do. Thus, on Dr. Harris's view, there is no source of objective moral duties because there is no moral lawgiver and no possibility of objective moral duty because there is no free will. Therefore, on his view, despite his protestations to the contrary, right and wrong do not really exist. Thus, Dr. Harris's naturalistic view fails to provide a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. Hence, if God does not exist, we do not have a sound foundation for morality, which is my second contention. In conclusion, then, we've seen that if God exists, we have a sound foundation for objective moral values and objective moral duties. But that if God does not exist, then we do not have a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. Dr. Harris's atheism thus sits very ill with his ethical theory. What I'm offering Dr. Harris tonight is not a new set of moral values. I think by and large we share the same applied ethics. Rather, what I'm offering is a sound foundation for the objective moral values and duties that we both hold dear. Thank you very much.